Welcome back to the Gridiron Expert, bringing you some of the best college football news, predictions, and analysis. Make sure you hit that like button, go follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Gridiron Expert, and check out our official website, thegridironexpert.com, where you can sign up for our weekly newsletter, which just came out today, and also sign up for our expert picks, which our week six expert picks will be coming out tomorrow. So don't miss out on any of this extra college football content. The links for all those things are in the description below. Well, we said a couple days ago that week five definitely was not the most exciting week of college football. Not many huge big games, not many thrilling games, and the bigger games all end up being kind of disappointing. Week six is hoping to flip that narrative, flip the script, change it up a little bit. We have three huge ranked versus ranked matchups and a couple games up here that have some major conference implications. So, of course, we're going to take a look at our five biggest games going into week six, predict all of them with our analysis, and at the end, take a look at our Heisman watch. And if you've been following our Heisman watch for the past few weeks, you can see that we already have two brand new names up there on the watch list. So make sure you don't miss out on that analysis at the end of this video. But we're going to jump right into it with number 18, Central Florida, traveling to Cincinnati. And as many of you know, we usually don't have group of five teams up on our big board, up on the games to watch going into week six. And it's nothing, it's nothing against group of five teams. It's just usually we have some bigger power five matchups that we have to keep our eye on. Uh, but this group of five matchup in the American Athletic Conference is monumental. It is huge. And I cannot emphasize that enough. It's going to happen on a Friday night, and we're going to start talking about the Knights first. Obviously, that's why this game is such a big storyline. Central Florida had their 27 regular season game winning streak snapped just a few weeks ago when they fell to Pittsburgh. But they have won 19 straight American Athletic Conference games. Last year, they took down Cincinnati, who was number 19 at the time, 38-13. to College game day was in town. That was a monumental moment for the Central Florida football program. In the past three years, the Knights have beaten the Bearcats by a combined score of 113-39. to So despite that loss to Pittsburgh, Central Florida still remains one of the more elite offensive teams, dare I say, in the country, and still remains in contention for a New Year's Six Bowl game uh, if they can remain the highest-ranked Group of Five conference champion, which, of course, Boise State's ahead of them right now, but there's still a lot of football left to be played. The Knights are averaging 49 points per game, averaging 336 passing yards per game, and also averaging over 230 rushing yards per game. It's a balanced offense. They can beat you with their speed. And people like to say that they don't have a defense. Well, they absolutely do. Freshman Dylan Gabriel, a quarterback, how about him? We didn't know what to expect from Central Florida. We knew they'd be without Mackenzie Milton. And then Daryl Mack goes down. Then Brandon Wimbush goes down. They're down to a freshman quarterback, and he is doing outstanding. Already thrown for over 1,300 yards, 14 touchdowns, and just two interceptions. The Knights are going to have their handfuls in this one, but the future is bright for them with a freshman quarterback and the way Gabriel is playing. On the other side, though, we have Cincinnati, who we said back in the preseason is by far the toughest test, will be the toughest test for Central Florida. They're averaging 27.8 points per game, and that's a little bit skewed because they were shut out against Ohio State back in Week 2. Just last week, they annihilated a good Marshall team, 52-14. to Luke Fickle, the job that he has done with the Bearcats has been absolutely unbelievable. And if he continue, if he wins this game and go, does like he did last year, that he went 11-2 last year, I could almost guarantee he's going to be taking a Power 5 coaching job uh, in, in 2020, potentially at Rutgers, having already fired Chris Ash. Desmond Ritter is doing great things at quarterback, over 800 yards through the air and eight touchdowns. Michael Warren picks up on the slack there at running back. This game could decide, should decide the American Athletic Eastern Division. That's what I think is going to happen. This game will decide the Eastern Division. And I think Central Florida goes on the road and gets a very, very close win against Cincinnati. This is probably going to be, outside of Pittsburgh, of course, probably the toughest test for Central Florida, besides maybe a road game against Tulane. Cincinnati still has road games against Houston and Memphis. So if they can get this win, it'll be huge for them and their chances of winning the, the division. But I just don't think they're quite to the point of upsetting the Knights and ruining their chances at a conference title and a New Year's Six Bowl game. Central Florida goes on the road. 
and gets a close win over a good Cincinnati program. Keep an eye on this one on Friday night. We go into Saturday now with number 14, Iowa, taking on number 19, Michigan. The FPI has only given Iowa a 37.9% chance to win this game. They haven't visited Michigan, guys, since 2012, but we all know what happened back when they last met in 2016. Michigan was number two, visiting Kinnick Stadium at night. What do you expect? The Hawkeyes were going to win that game, and they did, taking down the Wolverines 14-13. to Now, they're higher ranked in this game, but are not favored in this game. That doesn't happen very often. I think a lot of that goes with home field advantage, and maybe people not fully giving up on Michigan yet. But watch out for Iowa's very balanced offense, averaging 247.5 passing yards a game and 217.5 rushing yards per game. Nathan Stanley, arguably one of the better quarterbacks in the entire Big Ten, 965 yards and eight touchdowns already. And Makai Sargent, already five and a half yards per carry. And the defense is allowing just eight and a half points per game. Some people don't like to look at the stats, especially this early on in the season. But guys, keep in mind, Week 6 marks the halfway point of college football, so these stats do matter and can be an indication of what to expect going into some of these big games. So all of that having been said for Iowa, Michigan is a team that we said many people aren't ready to give up on them yet. I said back when they faced off against Wisconsin that I was never picking Michigan again. I, I said I could not do it. I've changed my mind. I've changed my mind very, very quickly. Yes, Michigan failed in their one big game of 2019. They fell to Wisconsin by 21 points at Camp Randall Stadium. They did bounce back a little bit, winning 52 to nothing over Rutgers, but once again, it's just Rutgers. And I hate to say that for, for Comic Dude and DM. I, I know that's not what you want to hear. I don't, I don't mean to be rude towards the Rutgers football program, but that it resulted in the firing of Chris Ash, about time for many, and what do, what do you expect? That's uh, It's like Alabama beating up on a team like Vanderbilt, Tennessee, or Arkansas. You can't really take away much from that game. Although the offense finally did come alive, racking up over 400 yards of offense compared to just 299 against the Badgers. So this is a huge game for Michigan. Almost feels like a must win. You hate to say that halfway through the season. But it feels like a must win for Michigan to try to keep their slim Big Ten title hopes alive because they haven't even played Penn State, Michigan State, obviously Ohio State, and Notre Dame out of conference in 2019. They still have four of those games remaining on their schedule. Michigan desperately needs a win here. I think the Wolverines' defense shuts down Nathan Stanley. I think the defense steps up. They do better against the pass statistically. I think they do that. Bottle up Sargent against the run. Michigan at home gets a huge, huge win for this Wolverines football program that once again are trying to keep their slim hopes alive of winning the Big Ten. Coming down, number three on our list, obviously the biggest game of week six. It's our game of the week. We're going to have more analysis coming out on this one tomorrow, so don't miss out on that. Number seven, Auburn, traveling to number 10, Florida. Now, this is a very rare matchup, guys, a cross-division matchup between the SEC West and the SEC East. It does not happen very often. So rare, actually, that the last time that Auburn traveled to Florida was back in 2007, when the Tigers took down the fourth-ranked Gators 20-17, kicking a field goal as time expired to get that win. Auburn rightfully deserves to be ranked number seven right now. They probably have the most impressive resume in all of college football, having already beaten Oregon on the road against Texas A&M, and then just last week annihilating Mississippi State 56-23, to where they put up 42 first-half points. And Bo Nix, guys, we criticized him early on the year, kind of emerged against the Bulldogs, throwing for 335 yards and two touchdowns, while also adding 56 rushing yards and a touchdown on the ground. So extremely, extremely impressive performance from Bo Nix, finally breaking through. He really hadn't been able to eclipse over 250 passing yards many times in those previous wins against Oregon, Kent State, Tulane, Texas A&M, but finally emerged against a decent Mississippi State team. Can he do the same on the road in what will be by far his toughest test and toughest environment he's played in in his very young Auburn career? Florida also, I should add on top of that, has one of the more experienced and toughest secondaries in the entire SEC. The key for Auburn through this through this very early stage for Bo Nix has been, while he's, he's thrived with the pass, hasn't done bad under Gus Malzahn's offense, the running game has done so well for the Tigers. 
Auburn's averaging 251 rushing yards per game, led by Jatarvius Whitlow, who has 463 yards and 7 touchdowns on the year, averaging 5 yards per carry. So when you've got a very dominant running game, it takes a lot of pressure off of your quarterback. The problem in this game is that Florida is only allowing 86.8 rushing yards per game. So if the Gators bottle up that run game, they're going to force Bo Nix to win this game through the air. He was able to do that last week against Mississippi State, but Florida's secondary, Florida period, is not Mississippi State. They're not. And the Swamp is not Jordan-Hare Stadium. It's one of the most difficult places to play in the SEC and one of the more difficult places to play in the nation. Florida, on the other hand, has questions at the quarterback themselves. Felipe Franks goes down against Kentucky. In comes Kyle Trask, who's doing fine, sitting at 2-0. Finished the game against Kentucky, giving the Gators a close win there, and then took down Tennessee, uh, and then Towson, of course, out of the FCS. He has 647 yards and five touchdowns on the year. Also added two rushing touchdowns on the ground. The key in this game is obviously Florida's ability to shut down Auburn's run game, and also Florida's ability to pressure Bo Nix. The Florida defensive line has 24 sacks this year. Auburn, very solid offensive line. But will they be able to match up against this dominant Florida defense? At home, at the Swamp, I don't think they're able to do it. I think Florida escaped with a huge win in a game that I think is very reminiscent of that win over LSU last year in the Swamp. So we're not an Auburn hater. We have nothing against the Tigers. We like Florida in this game for those reasons alone. Coming down at number four, number 25, Michigan State, traveling to number four, Ohio State. The Buckeyes have won three straight over the Spartans, including a 48-3 win last time in Columbus. Now, we said last week, and we continue to own up to it, we said last week that we thought Nebraska was going to be Ohio State's biggest test. Thought it was going to be their toughest test. We had Nebraska winning that game. We were absolutely wrong. We know that. Michigan State now is finally Ohio State's biggest test in 2019, especially because Michigan State has a very, very solid defense. Their defense is extremely talented, guys, and going up against such a potent offense in Ohio State that's averaging 55 or over 50 points per game, that's going to be extremely tough. That's going to be extremely tough and something they're going to have to give. Michigan State's defense is either going to be able to slow down that offense or Ohio State will continue to roll. Now, for the Spartans... They have, we mentioned their defense and how well they've played. We mentioned how well they've played uh, in, in, re in recent games. But we know that if they want to have any chance of winning this game, not only are they going to have to shut down Ohio State defensively, offensively, but Michigan State's going to have to create some offense of their own. They're going to have to get something going. And as we've discussed in the comments and on previous videos, their offense has been so inconsistent. Brian Lewerke had a bad year in 2018, has bounced back in 2019, has over 1,300 passing yards, 10 touchdowns, and just one interception. He was also the leading rusher versus Indiana last week. And what was a very narrow and probably closer than expected win for the Spartans. So if he can play well against this Ohio State defense that's allowing just 8.6 points per game, then Michigan State has a fighting chance. But Ohio State, with Justin Fields, who already has 16 passing touchdowns, who can absolutely beat you on the ground as well. And the dominance of Ohio State's defense playing at home at night, I don't like Michigan State's chances in this one. Even though Michigan State came on the road and won this game back in 2015, a game that sent the Spartans to the college football playoff, I don't see history repeating itself. I see this game not being as bad as the 48-3 beatdown they had two years ago, but Ohio State wins comfortably in this one. And then our final game we have up on our big board, not a ranked versus ranked matchup, but one that does have major conference implications, especially in the Pac-12 North, California traveling to number 13, Oregon. Why is this game so important? Well, Oregon right now is sitting at 1-0 in conference play. California is sitting at 1-1 in conference play. Of course, they fell to Arizona State just last week, but they did beat Washington. The Huskies are also sitting at 1-1 one one in conference play and have a game against Stanford that if the Cardinal win, will create chaos in the Pac-12 North Division. If California wins this game, they still have a chance to win the Pac-12 North despite losing their quarterback Chase Garbers in that upset loss to Arizona State. 
that prevented California from being the lone undefeated team in the Pac-12. The end of the Pac-12 of having any undefeated teams. So the Pac-12, as we've seen since week one, just continues to beat themselves up. More than likely, they're not going to have a, a team in the college football playoff unless Oregon were to maybe win out. And that would, of course, have to start here with a win over the Golden Bears. And I think they do win this one. I think they, like Ohio State, win this one comfortably. While California has a stunning, stunning secondary and a very good defense, they're not going to have enough offensively with Devin Monster, who was horrible in relief for Chase Garbers. They're not going to have enough out of him offensively to come on the road and beat the Ducks, led by Justin Herbert, who already has over 1,100 yards 14 touchdowns, and no interceptions in 2019. Evan Weaver for the Golden Bears, guys, the star linebacker for the for California, cannot win this game alone for the Golden Bears. He's going to have to step up both offensively and shutting down Justin Herbert. But even if they do that, Oregon has C.J. Ferdell. I like the Ducks at home to take care of business and take sole possession of that North Division, although we have to be cautious because they still have a road game left against Washington. But right now, Oregon takes care of business against Cal in a major Pac-12 North showdown. So those are your five big big winners going into week six. Five biggest games. We're going to have Game of the Week analysis coming out for Auburn and Florida tomorrow. And maybe one more Game of the Week coming out on Friday. So don't miss out on any of that. But right now, I want to touch on the Heisman race briefly. We already know about Jalen Hurts. 308 passing yards and three touchdowns in the first half alone against Texas Tech. He finished the day with 485 total yards and four total touchdowns against the Red Raiders. His next game luckily comes this Saturday against Kansas. Another potential stat padding game for Jalen Hurts to try to clinch another Heisman Trophy for this Oklahoma football program. Hurts and our big board is number one in the Heisman race. These are not ranked in any way, but if we were ranking them, Jalen Hurts would be number one. We have Tua Tungabailoa next. He just set the school record for Alabama with six passing touchdowns against Ole Miss. He actually finished the day with seven total, adding a touchdown on the ground. He also has set another school record for throwing five or more touchdowns in three straight games for the Crimson Tide. He also just broke the all-time record for passing touchdowns in Alabama football history, breaking A.J. McCarron's record. And keep in mind, guys, Tua's tenure, his career at Alabama has been very, very short. This is only his second year as a full-time starter. He came in in relief at times two years ago, won the national championship for him, started all last year, and has started every game this year. But guys, it's a young career for Tua, and he's already breaking records left and right. So absolutely deserves to be in Heisman contention. He's on bye week this week before going on the road to face off against Texas A&M. Certainly a game we'll be keeping our eye on in week seven. Next, we have Justin Fields, the quarterback over at Ohio State. Absolutely deserves to be up here. He's new to our Heisman watch. 284 total yards and four touchdowns against Nebraska. He is number two in the entire nation with 23 total touchdowns behind, of course, Tua Tungabailoa. His next game comes against Michigan State, as we mentioned. If he has a big game against this Spartans defense, his stock will continue to rise in the Heisman watch. So watch out for Justin Fields to see how he fares against what will be absolutely his toughest defensive test yet. And then finally, on the Heisman watch, a guy that no one's talking about that much, but it's time to start talking about Chuba Hubbard, the running back for Oklahoma State, who leads the nation with 938 rushing yards for the Cowboys. He had two 196 rushing yards against Kansas State, a nationally ranked team, just last Saturday. He's averaging 7.3 yards per carry, has 10 rushing touchdowns, and that game against Kansas State was his third game this season with at least 200 rushing yards. Unbelievable for Chuba Hubbard and his Oklahoma State offense. His next game comes this Saturday against Texas Tech, who's allowing 179.8 rushing yards per game and just got torched by Jalen Hurts over at Oklahoma. So Chuba Hubbard has another great opportunity to have another big day against a Big 12 opponent. He will certainly eclipse 1,000 yards on the season uh, already. And just in week six, will already eclipse 1,000 yards. And it's time to start talking about him as a Heisman contender. People want to talk about Jonathan Taylor. People want to talk about Travis Etienne. 
start talking about Chuba Hubbard, who could very well be one of the best running backs in the entire country. Joe Burrow, Jonathan Taylor, Sam Ellinger, all on the outside looking in right now. The Heisman race is just really getting started. We have a lot more analysis coming on that through the rest of the season. But right now, these are the four names you need to watch out for, especially going in to the halfway point of the college football season. So your five biggest games, Heisman watch, what more could you ask for? It's going to be a great week of college football. Don't miss out on any of it. So guys, once again, thank you for watching us here on YouTube. Make sure you go check us out on Twitter and Instagram at Gridiron Expert and check out the website, thegridironexpert.com, where you can sign up for our newsletter and sign up for our expert picks, which will be coming out tomorrow. And once again, thank you for watching us here on YouTube. Please continue to like, comment, and subscribe. And we'll see you next time on the Gridiron Expert. Oh,